would like to invite our next speaker to the stage, Dr. Radhika Khosla. Dr. Khosla is a fellow at the Center for Policy Research New Delhi and has focused her work uh, on energy research in India, particularly on the demand side of Indian energy and energy use within the built environment and on the linkages between energy and climate change. She was previously staff scientist with the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council in the US, where she led research and implementation on building policies in Indian states. Dr. Khosla will speak on multiple objective-based energy and climate policy and climate policy making. Dr. Khosla. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, talk about integrating development and climate priorities, which is um, increasingly relevant in growing economies such as in India, but but even otherwise. And what I'm going to do over the next um, 15 minutes or so is is make three points. So sort of walk over three issues. One is to sort of set the context and talk about the evidence of co-benefits or, or multiple objectives and, and, and how they operate. The second is to talk through a method of how do we operationalize policy making that is anchored around multiple objectives. And then third is to think about issues as we move forward in this area of work. So to start with, um, why multiple objectives and why this framing? So increasingly in, in policy making, we're in a context where there are a number of transitions going on. There's a demographic transition in India, there's an urbanization transition, there's a real estate transition, and, and we're juggling multiple objectives. And this, again, is something that is seen even more so in the context of climate and development linkages. So at the national level now, the goals or the priorities that the country like India needs to think about are not just energy for growth but it's energy for growth, energy security, energy access, jobs, local environment issues such as air and water pollution, and global environmental outcomes, so things such as climate change. Now, given that we're juggling with all of this, how do we work through it? And, and the framing of multiple objectives also finds salience in the recent Paris Agreement, because what the agreement says is that now countries every five years have to process and submit a uh, a nationally determined contribution, which is intended to promote climate objectives, but as the, as the name says, it op also opens up the space for other nationally determined objectives. So again, the, the, the climate context is also one which is forcing us to think about national development objectives, and this framing is salient also in India's plan, India's national climate plan, which has said that India will promote actions that uh, promote, again, development, while also yielding core benefits for addressing climate change. So this is at the core of, of India's actions too. And, and, and the question really becomes, how do we move forward if we have these multiple objectives that we are dealing with? So what do we know about, about the, how these objectives play out? And what we're seeing is that there's a growing and a, a, a broad base of understanding around co-effects. So what we have here is on, on, on the table, there are sectoral mitigation measures um, that are laid out as rows, and, and in the columns we have how these mitigation measures line up against different goals. So for instance, you have goals such as economic, environmental, and social, and pick, pick a line, so say there's um, energy efficiency. So how does energy efficiency do in terms of its economic goals, in terms of, not its, but the, the economic goals of the country, or the social goals, or, or environmental goals. And so the arrows that you he see here, so you have green arrows that are going up, that demonstrates that there are synergies, or that you can meet multiple goals with the same action. So similar to what Narsima just talked, do certain actions that get you, get you benefits across different goals. But sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can only achieve a goal if you actually have to trade off against something else. So for instance, if we look at carbon capture and storage, while it does well on some aspects, on things like health and safety, actually it doesn't do so well. So it's a policy option that can do well in one dimension, but maybe not so well in another dimension. Now, while there is this growing body of knowledge around, around thinking like this and, and on, on building the analytical base to be able to inform such such a structure, there is less that we know about social effects and, and, and about a number of other environmental effects. And, and the trends suggest that there are, there are co-benefits. When we undertake certain climate actions, we can have development outcomes. 
But at the same time, we don't really know that much about con context-specific um, issues. So for instance, in the India case, there is limited attention right now to thinking about how do these multiple objectives relate to each other, particularly in Indian energy and climate planning. So now, how do we, how do we meaningfully assess these multiple objectives? Having different things that we want to pursue means that we can't have everything. We can't fully meet all of these objectives. So in order to assess them then, there are at least three things that we need. There are at least three characteristics that we need to be able to meet. The first is that we need a framework. We need a framework that will tell us ex ante or up front what are the synergies and what are the trade-offs across objectives. So I'll give an example from the coal target that was recently put in place for 1.5 billion tons of domestic coal production in India. Now, if we, if we had that target, but we, if we also had it with the information that would tell us what its implications would be, it would be much more useful. For instance, the target will give us energy access benefits. We, we, you know, that, that's sort of the premise. But what about the air pollution costs of putting such a target in place? Where is the information for us to be able to see, is this, is this policy actually worth it when we, when we place its benefits against its costs? The second thing to be able to assess multiple objectives meaningfully is to be able to integrate qualitative information, not just quantitative information. So often when we are thinking about policy making and decisions, the implementation piece is left out, which is to say that, that a, a, a policy might be technically very feasible, but what is its implement, implementability going to look like, and is that feasible or not? And the third piece is who decides which objectives should be balanced. So often these decisions are made at a national level with a group of experts, but really to be able to have a meaningful discussion around multiple objectives, we need the process to be driven by stakeholder agendas and by dialogue, and by not having it be sector focused in a particular line ministry where you're not really talking across sectors. Now that's a tall order, and, and how do we actually achieve it? Is there a method by which we can achieve it? So I'm going to propose one approach, um, which is to use multi-criteria decision analysis as a tool to, to be able to assess multiple objectives. Now MCDA, as some of you might be familiar with, is a well-established framework and in a range of decision-making arenas. And it has a number of advantages that could be helpful in this kind of context. One, it forces you to design your policies that are anchored around environmental, social, economic, and institutional goals. So if there's anything, any policy action that I'm thinking of, I have to first think about what are my goals in the environmental realm, in the social realm, economic, and institutional realm. The second is that it allows you to normalize qualitative and quantitative information. And this is interesting because often when we incorporate qualitative information, we come up with results that we wouldn't have otherwise. So we applied this um, in a small district in Maharashtra on a cooking fuels transition study. And what we found was that the role of drudgery or the role, that, um, the role of uh, procuring a fuel, the time it takes to actually get a fuel and make it usable, that is an important aspect of people's decision making about what cooking fuel they want to use. And in that aspect, clean cooking fuels, so for instance, an LPG cylinder doesn't do so well because you have to get the cylinder, you have to book it, you have to travel to refill it, you have to travel to return it, and people are not happy to do that. So actually, even a clean cooking fuel like LPG doesn't do so well on drudgery, and that factors into how people make decisions about what cooking fuel they use. The, another thing, the third thing that MCD allows you to do is to have relative weights on different objectives. Now, every objective is not going to be weighed in the same way by different stakeholders. So for instance, you have to ask questions, an, an example of a question that you can ask is, is to a household, is minimizing air pollution more or less valuable than climate mitigation? I mean, it, it, it's a tough question to answer and there's a way in which you can do it, but it poses the question which makes the decision-making um, process much more transparent. And then lastly, it's underpinned continuously by involvement of stakeholders. And so suddenly you have a much larger base of informants to decisions, and the database by which you're making decisions also increases. Now, without going through the methodology in too much detail, um, I, the, the steps of it are laid out here. I just want to make one point, which is the methodology is one that involves both political steps and technical steps. 
and the first few bits of it, which are often the hardest, the first three, which is defining the scope of the problem, identifying what your objectives are going to be, really getting consensus on the objectives of, of um, whatever your, your decision is, and then identifying the options that can help you meet those objectives, those are political steps. But then once you do that, you do need the technical ability to be able to assess the alternatives, to be able to normalize preferences, aggregate weights, do sensitivity analysis, and then the decision making, once you have all your information on the table, that decision making, again, is the result of both a political step and, and a technical step. So I'll show you um, what Oh, I'm sorry, that's not very clear. So um, the, uh, this is an example of what it looks like to apply this framework to a particular sector. So we applied it to the building sector, and, and we asked the question, we asked the policy question, what energy efficiency policies will bring maximum benefits from India's real estate transformation? And then we said, if th that's the question we're asking, what are our objectives? So there are economic objectives, and under that, we want to maximize electricity savings, maximize diesel savings, and those diesel savings come from using less gen generators, maximize the number of jobs created. But we also want to minimize social costs. And, and in, given the policy problem of energy efficiency in buildings, the social costs will mean minimizing upfront expenditure. So households want to have as little upfront expenditure as they can, and they also want to minimize the recurring expenditure that they, that they spend on their energy bills. Now, an institutional hurdle in this case, or the, the institutional objective, is that we need a policy, or we would like a policy, that minimizes the political economy risk, which is to say that the, the resistance up front of a policy is something that we want very little of, because it's, it's not ideal to have a policy that's going to be so difficult to implement, because there's a huge lobby against it, say, in this case, real estate developers. Also, another institutional objective is to say that the trans transaction costs have to be low. So you don't want a policy that's going to be so difficult to implement that, that you don't actually make it through. So laying out this map as, and uh, the, the objectives hierarchy, as it's called, is actually very useful in, in just seeing like this is the scale of what we are dealing with. And in making any decision, we're going to meet some of these, and we're not going to meet some of these. But what, what is that synergy going to be, and what is that trade-off going to look like? And can we make a decision where we, all of that is laid out ahead of the decision-making process? So when we did this for the building sector, um, we came up with this, this spider diagram here. Um, what it does is the four corners of, of the diamond are the four different objectives. So there's environmental, social, economic, and institutional. And the different colored lines are the different policy options. So if you look at the green line, that is the adoption of building energy codes. So codes actually do very well environmentally and economically. They're, they're excellent policy options if we want to achieve environmental and economic objectives. But they actually do very poorly on the institutional dimension. And, and that the institutional dimension incorporates the implementation piece of this. This is actually reflective of how, how the, the policy making in nationally around building energy decisions has evolved where a lot of the focus over the last 10, 15 years has been on code implementation. But we see very little progress because the implementation piece of it has, has not been studied. And it's not considered when um, allocations are made or priorities are set about what might be the best thing, best policy to, to go after. Um, the yellow is, the, is accelerating building rating systems. That's, it's the opposite of um, the, the codes example because it actually does very well institutionally. And, and it does well because you have to change very little. But it gives you little benefits environmentally, little benefits economically. And socially, the, 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 cost, the, the benefits are not so great either. So if you have this kind of diagram ahead of time, it helps you to choose what policy you want to undertake and what it's going to give you and what, what it's not. So I'll end just by showing you um, the, this is very initial work. We're just beginning to work in the city of Rajkot by looking at their smart city vision document and, and working with them on adopting such an approach in their city planning. And we pulled out the document and started making sense of it. And what you see is there are all of these words thrown out, right? So there's sort of access to safe sanitation, 24-7 power supply. 
And even in sorting through that, you see that some of these are objectives, some of these are policies, some of them is, are objectives and policies. So we're using this as a starting point to be able to have a conversation with the different groups of people within the municipality and outside there, and then hopefully come up with the kind of objectives hierarchy tree that I, I showed you before. So just in, in closing, we, this sort of objective, multiple objective framing is something that, that we think has relevance to actual decision-making context, both at the national level, if you're thinking about national energy policy, but also at the sectoral level. So for instance, city planning or, or thinking about a renewables future, it would be helpful if, if we were able to, to have this kind of spider diagram or however we want to um, represented graphically about, say, the national solar mission or the 175 gigawatt target. What, what does that target mean environmentally, economically, institutionally, and socially? So, so we think there is scope to be able to do this both at the national level and at the subnational level, but it requires an ex ante basis for, for assessing multiple objectives and ideally an ex post evaluative framework, so where you go back and see, is this actually working or not working? Um, the, the challenges really are that where, are the, where is the appropriate institutional architecture where you can have this kind of conversation? How do you have a conversation across sectors and break the sort of siloed approach and, and instead talk deliberatively and transparently with stakeholders from different places? And, and, and that, that's sort of one of the, the key issues in being able to do this. The second is to really be able to be articulate about what implementation considerations are, really understanding what that means for different policy options. And then, of course, the, just the lack of data. It's, it's hard to do some of the analytical work to be able to come up with, with an answer um, like, like the one I showed you if you don't have the, the material or the data to be able to inform that. So, for instance, issues around um, inclusive growth and distribution or around jobs, we don't really have that much data to be able to always arrive at a sensible answer. And in the end, I'll just say that all of this is really about a good process. It's about a good process to be able to inform decision-making much more than it is about coming up with one good answer.